the Lord has a vessel he is using. And that is our GS, our great man of God, whom the Lord has been using to sharpen us, to revive us. Let's bless the name of the Lord for him. Constant strength, additional grace, sufficient grace. In fact, Jesus Christ told the Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. Let's thank the Lord for his sufficient grace upon his life, upon his wife too. Let's worship the Lord. Today begins the first day of this minister's conference. Power for productivity in his service. Let's also worship the Lord because today wonders will take place. The weak shall be made strong. Even the ministers and church workers that are no more focused today, there will be revival. There will be restoration. There will be fruitfulness. Let's worship the Lord in advance because all of us are going to live here today being renewed. You can't go the way you came. No. You can't go the way you came. The Lord is willing, the Lord is able to sharpen us. And we have come into the potter's house. And he is going to break us. He is going to melt us. He is going to remold us and put us into circulation. In Jesus' name we pray. Another amen. Let's now call upon the Lord. If there's no peace in our nation, if there's any trouble anywhere, we will not be able to gather here this day and other programs. Let's call upon the Lord and ask the Lord, who is the governor general of every nation, that he will give us peace. Peace in Enugu State. Peace in Southeast. Peace in Nigeria. Peace in Africa. Peace in the whole world. Let's worship. Let us pray and call upon the Lord. We need his grace. Let's pray. Let's pray. We pray in Jesus' name. Let's also call upon the Lord, our GS, the convener of this program. We know he's a human being. Let's ask for sufficient grace upon him. Let's ask for additional grace, multiplied grace, marvelous grace upon him. It will mount from strength to strength, from energy to energy. Let's call upon, his, upon the Lord for our general superintendent. No weakness, no tiredness, and the Lord will put his word in his mouth. It will not lack utterances. It will not lack inspiration. In Jesus' name we pray. We are here as church workers, professionals, ministers of the gospel. We are going to pray. Pray for yourself. You will never go the way you came. Whatever challenges in ministry, a change must take place. Call upon the Lord. Present yourself. Present other ministers. Present other church workers before the Lord that there be wind of revival. Beginning from us, when we are revived, when we are strengthened, when we are renewed, when we are empowered, we go out to empower the nation. We go out to move the church forward. We go out to win souls for the Lord. Pray. Tell the Lord, whichever area you have on challenges, the Lord is here, is going to touch you, is going to touch me.
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, you are the great God of wonders. Thank you for today. Thank you for the past. Thank you for the future. Because you, you have brought us together to sharpen us, to shape us, to reveal more of your mind unto us and empower us to go after your will, your word, your way, your wisdom. So, Father, we pray that your mighty presence will envelop this place so that no minister goes the way he came. We all be revived. We'll all be strengthened. As we also pray, the convener, our GM, And the church workers will be empowered. And going back from here, we're going back, sharpen the tools. Thank you for the answer. We are very grateful because you have done it for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we keep standing this morning, we are going to worship the name of the Lord. The stay vast love of our God never see that he is mine. Let all the sea cheese. 
Jesus in you. Let all see Jesus in you. Keep telling the story. Be faithful and true. Let all the see Jesus in you. Personalize it, personalize it, and let Jesus in me. Oh, let all see Jesus in me. Oh, keep telling the story. Be
The Lord will touch you this morning. I say you will be transformed this day. His power will be come upon your life. And your ministry, your profession will never remain the same. Your profession will never remain the same. Let's have our seats. We praise the name of the Lord who has brought us to this point at this minister's conference. And you are all welcome to this minister's conference. And I want to assure you that God's power will come upon you. And you are going to become more productive in Jesus' name. I want to introduce some of the dignitaries we have. We have a lot of our pastors from outside deeper life. We are from outside deeper life as a pastor, a bishop, a church founder, camp chairman, and you know all the camp uh, pastors. Please, can you raise your hand? You are pastor from outside deeper life. Please, can we have you raise your hand? God bless you in Jesus' name. I would have said that you are not crapping. We have here also, you know, we have here Pastor Chukuka, Nicholas, watchman, charismatic state pastor. Please, can you rise and let them see you? God bless you. We have all our state overseers from the southeast. We have Pastor Magnus Mwoke. He is the state overseer of Ebony II. Can you <laughs> praise the Lord? We have also our state overseer from Abia One. Pastor I.K. Ibe. God bless you. We also have our pastor from state of, the state of Basia, Eboyitu, Pastor Korumbos Okpara. You are welcome, sir. We have Pastor Chike Onwa is the state pastor of Anambra. And number one, we have Pastor Sylvester Deme, State Overseer, Enugu II. We have Pastor Michael Amadi, State Overseer, Anambra II. We have Pastor Obina Nkenjika, the State Overseer, Abia II. And we have all that people that are here. I believe God that as we have come to this conference, God will use his servant to empower every one of us. Shall we please be on our feet as we take our congregational song? Let's stand up on our feet as we take the congregational song. We are singing the second song. Let the fire fall. Let the fire fall. They were gathered in the upper chamber as commanded by the risen Lord and the promise of the Father. There they sought with one accord when the Holy Ghost from heaven descended like a rushing wind and tongue of fire. So, dear Lord, we seek thy blessings. Come with thy glory now. Our hearts inspire. As Elijah, we will raise the altar for our testimony clear and true. 
Christ the Savior, loving healer, coming Lord and baptizer too, ever-flowing grace and full salvation for a re for rain race they love as planned. Blessed at breast adore thee and our songs of worship raised. Let the crowd of glory now descending fill our heart with holy ecstasy. Come in all thy glory fullness. Blessed Holy Spirit, have thy way. Let the fire fall. Let the fire fall. Let the fire from heaven fall. We are waiting and expecting. Now in faith, dear Lord, we call. Let the fire fall. Let the fire fall. On thy promise we depend. From the glory of thy presence, let the Pentecostal fire fall or descend. Set up as we 
can have your seat. We want to welcome the camp choir to come and give out their song. Camp choir, please. Let's come up to this. And uh, while we are singing the congregational song, the camp chairman, Reverend Emmanuel, Ede just entered. Sir, you are welcome. God bless you. Let's welcome the camp choir. Let's welcome the camp choir. house been brought down oh glory praise the lord salvation has been brought down from heaven oh and shout, shout. and tell it our word around go preach it tell it to them tell it to them preach the word of God that we might win our trying 
in, but Jesus took me in. And a little light from heaven filled my soul. It filled my soul with love. I wrote my name above. And just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Have a little talk. Thank you, Kankwaya. Appreciate Kankwaya. Just a little talk with Jesus. We set everything right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Today, you will be empowered. Yeah. I say today, you are going to receive power for productivity in his service, in Jesus' name. Who will receive the power? Are you sure? Let's be on our feet because the man of God this morning is loaded and is going to inject you and the power of God will come into your heart. I want you to close your eyes and say, Lord, empower me as we receive the man of God. Close your eyes, tell the Lord, empower me. This will be a word of prayer. Father, we're here for you. Son, we're here for you. Holy Ghost. We're here for you. Search us. Lead us. 
empower us so that we will effectively handle everything you've given us to do. We pray that the excellent ministry will be established in the church in this nation and then in the nations of the world in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody shout, Amen. Amen. We're looking at Hebrews. Thank you. Consider we're looking at Hebrews chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 6. Hebrews chapter 8. We're looking at verse 6. It says, But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. You'll see there is talking about Christ, our Savior, our Lord, not only our Savior and Lord, our forerunner, our example, and our model. It says he has obtained. If we're going to be in the excellent ministry, we have to obtain. You cannot attain it by your own power, by your own strength, and by your own ingenuity. We obtain a more excellent ministry. You never obtain anything except you desire you never obtain anything except you are willing to abandon the things that are not excellent. We have to leave the bad for the good. We have to leave even the good for the better. We have to leave the past for the present. And that is how we obtain that more excellent ministry. If you are satisfied with what you have, if you are satisfied with everything you've done, you're not even have the eagerness, you'll not have the desire, you'll not have the passion, you'll not have the drive, you'll not want to pay the price to obtain what is higher, what is greater, the more excellent means he now says by how much he also is the mediator of a better covenant. Once you stay with the old covenant, the abolished covenant, the Old Testament covenant, once you stay with that and you are before Calvary and you are before even the open, the first page of Matthew, you're still there in the old, you're still there dwelling in Malachi, you're still there dwelling in Exodus and Leviticus and you have not crossed over to that covenant which is new you'll be there but you'll not be following after christ you're doing everything that came before the cross and before calvary but it says now he is the mediator is no more aaron and is no more the sons of aaron and is no more the old testament old covenant theology it is the better covenant the new covenant and is the mediator forth as ambassadors of that mediation of the mediator and then we preach that better covenant it says which was established upon better promises have you seen that word better there a more excellent ministry better and it is a better covenant and it is the promise of God that he gave at Calvary and he finished it and finalized it and gave that to us now and we are now called as sons of God, daughters of God, ministers of God, servants of God, ambassadors in Christ that we will go to proclaim what Christ will be proclaiming today if he were in the world, in the physical. In fact, he tells us in First Peter chapter 2, and it says in verse 21, for even hereunto were ye called. He called us to salvation. He called us to service. And he says, here is where we are called to, for because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example, leaving us a model that ye should follow 
his steps. That now in life we follow his steps. In ministry we follow his steps. And in the preaching of the gospel we follow his steps. In the content of the gospel that we preach we follow his steps. If we are following any other personality, even in the Bible, if we're following Moses and if we're following the Levitical law, if we're following those old covenant people, we're not following Christ because he came to establish, he came to give us the better covenant established upon better promises and it says this is what to do and this is what to follow i pray the lord will so touch our hearts it'll so turn our hearts it'll so transform our hearts that we will follow without an ear's breath and without going this way or that way, I will follow Christ all the way through in this ministry, the excellent ministry in Jesus' name. And we're coming to the message today, and it is the compulsory spiritual experiences of an excellent minister. The compulsory spiritual experiences of an excellent ministry. Three things we're looking at. We're looking at number one, the supremacy and the of God's only begotten son. God's only begotten son, supreme, higher than all, higher than Moses, higher than Aaron, higher than Joshua, higher than the angels, higher than anyone that had ever lived on the face of the earth. I had an Adam and Eve is supreme. God had given him that supremacy. Number two is the salvation by grace for obedient believing sons. Salvation. Salvation is for all. Why has not everyone gotten that salvation? Because there is a word from him. And that word, the word of grace, he gives us, he calls us, he says, repent ye and believe the gospel. And as we him in obedience to his call, in obedience to his word, in obedience to what he's telling us, and we believe on him, we become obedient, believing sons. Number three is the sanctification for graciously open blood bought servants. We're looking at number one here. Number one is the supremacy of God's only begotten son we're looking at hebrews chapter one and we're looking at uh, verse one it says god who at sundry times and in diverse manner speak in time past unto unto the uh, fathers by the prophets you know what he's saying he said in time past he spoke by the prophets. Look at verse 2. It says, As in these last days spoken unto us by his son. It says, It's gone higher. It's revealing the kind of salvation that the prophets were examining and searching whether it was for them or not. It says he spoke to the fathers by those prophets, but now in these last days he has spoken unto us. He's speaking unto us by his son whom he has appointed. He has appointed whom he has appointed no man appointed him, and no nation appointed him. Israel did not appoint him, they crucified him. Israel did not exalt him. 
they slew him. Israel did not anoint, appoint, and engage the Lord Jesus Christ, the appointment of the Lord, the appointment of the Savior. It was not by voting, even voting by angels or voting by men. It was the appointment of God that it says, whom he has appointed, heir of all things, possessor of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Look at verse 3. In verse 3 it says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, that he is Christ, the Son, the Savior, our Lord, is the express image of God's person. Everything the Father wanted done, he did. If you're thinking of the will of God, Jesus is the expression of the will of God. Is salvation will of God? Yes, because Jesus is the expression of the will of God. Is healing the will of God? Yes, because he did that. And Jesus is the expression of the will of God. Is holiness the will of God in every generation for everyone? Yes, because Jesus is the expression of the will of God. And he's upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, not Christ, an angel, whatever the name of the angel, he by himself alone purged our sins. Not, um, not Jesus and the founder of a denomination, the founder of a religion, but Jesus by himself. If you are praying for salvation, you pray only in the name of Jesus. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus. If you are praying for any blessing from the Father, any blessing from heaven, you pray in the name of Jesus and Jesus only because he by himself, himself alone, he purged our sins and now he sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. We're talking about Christ and we're talking about his supremacy, the supremacy of God's only begotten son. Look at three things here. Number one, we're looking at uh, the exalted position of the anointed son. Exalted, exalted position of the anointed son. Number two is the experienced purging by his acceptable sacrifice. Number three is the extraordinary power of the almighty sustainer. Look at number one there. Number one is the exalted position of the anointed son. It tells us in Philippians chapter to two, reading there from verse 9, wherefore God also has highly exalted him. God also, God, if you believe in God as the creator, if you believe in God as the disposer of all things, if you believe in God as the possessor of the whole earth, because he made the walls and the fullness thereof, if you say you believe in God, here is what God has done. If you put down who God has exalted, you are not worth God. If you shatter what God is putting together, you are not of God. It says, wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. He has given Christ, his only begotten son, a name above every name. In verse 10, it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Give me a good amen. amen. And your knee is who to, is to bow first. You know, there are people, they want that enemy to bow, and they are not bowing. 
to the name of Jesus. They are not surrendered. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. They do not bow the knee. They do not subject themselves to Christ as Savior, Christ as Lord, and Christ as Commander. And while they are standing firm, adamant in their own mind, adamant and they stand like that and they will not bend for christ they want the name of jesus to work for them and everything to bend before them it doesn't happen that way you are the one to bow first all your desires all your aspiration everything all your ambition everything your thought i want to be i want to do i want to go i want to let that one bow put everything beneath the feet of christ and say lord not my will but as thou wilt and it is when you have your mind your heart your life your ambition your personality bowing unto the lord then you can come in the place of authority and everything you say shall bow will bow in jesus name that at the name of jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and then in verse 11 it says and that every tongue should confess before you tell other people to confess christ your own tongue too should confess him and confess him as the one that can forgive and confess him as the one that can cleanse if we confess our sin he is faithful and just to forgive our sins it doesn't stop there and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and when that has taken place now we come to other people and we tell them you know what the bible says that you confess every tongue you confess that jesus is lord and you cannot say that if jesus is not your lord if he's not the lord of your plan if you say like pilate what i've written i've written what i've planned i've planned and my mind is said not even a verse of scripture can change I, what i want to do what i plan is what i plan if you are like that you're not making him your lord but when you come and you say lord I, I, I thought this is what I will do. I thought this is where I will go. I thought this is what I will plan. But now you are Lord, the captain of my salvation. It says to the glory of God the Father, the exalted position of the anointed son. Look at number two here. Number two, it says, the experience purging by his acceptable sacrifice by his acceptable sacrifice i'm sure you know that since he had done the sacrifice acceptable he has given the sacrifice he said it is finished if you by any means, in what, whatever way you go to bring another sacrifice, it will be like the sacrifice of Cain. It will not be accepted. That's why hearts are not changed. That's why hearts are not transformed. They want, they're not satisfied with the final acceptable sacrifice of Christ. They must bring their own sacrifice. Yes, I see Abel brought the acceptable sacrifice and looking forward to the lamb that is slain for the sins of the world. But Cain said, not me, the works of my hand, it amounts to nothing. In fact, it's less than nothing. It's negative. It's rejected by the Lord. When you, uh, we have the final sacrifice of Christ, it is finished and it is free and it is full everything we need from heaven we get through christ because the purging comes and the forgiveness comes and the purification comes and the possession of the blessing of god everything comes by the acceptable sacrifice of christ any other sacrifice knocks you off 
kicks you up. Any other sacrifice makes the Father to turn away from you. Who is this man that is still bringing a fowl, still bringing a goat, and still bringing, a, you know, tortilla or whatever, and he thinks he's going to please me? He wants to replace the sacrifice of my only begotten son with whatever sacrifice it makes God to turn away from such a person. He tells us in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 who being the express, the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself if you're going to be free from sin consciousness if you're going to be free from the overpowering influence of sin in your past life if you're going to be free from any remembrance of your past life i i himself christ christ only he purged our sins and there are times when you know people think they have washed clothes it's not clean enough the wash plates is not clean enough and no man can purge and cleanse and forgive and no man can purify like christ in fact the only washing the only cleansing the only purification acceptable in heaven is the one christ has done when he had by himself purged our sins and now he sat down why did he sit down he sat down because everything has been done it's finished the work it's accomplished the work and the father has given attestation to that that i accept that you don't have to do anything anymore christ doesn't have to pay another price, do another sacrifice because before we can be pardoned, before we can be saved, before we can be purged, before we can be sanctified. The blood, the blood has been shed now. He sat on the right hand of majesty on high. Look at First Corinthians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 7. In First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that she may be a new lamb, as ye are, and as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. You have to believe that. You have to accept that. You have to claim that and cling to that. That when I see his blood, it's no more the, side, the animal sacrifice in the Old Testament, but Christ who died and Christ who rose again and Christ who has the power, the power to forgive, the power to cleanse, the power to renew, and the power to bruise the enemy, the devil, and the power to even raise the dead. Power, power, all power in heaven on earth is given unto him him he says now because he sacrificed for us come place your confidence in that look at verse 8 in verse 8 therefore let us keep the feast not with the old leaven neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness now christ has forgiven you if you are born again and now you cannot hold malice again and you cannot say i'm going to revenge that other church that other believer has done something i don't appreciate he says are you purged are you cleansed then he cleanses you from the hatred of the old life and he says all malice all wickedness were abandoned but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Insincerity is gone. Hypocrisy is gone. Pretense is gone because we're purged by the blood of the Lord. Look at number three here. Number three, we're looking at the extraordinary power 
of the almighty sustainer, the extraordinary power of the almighty sustainer. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. It says, who being the brightness of his glory, Yes, uh, and the express image of his person upholding all things, upholding all people, upholding all believers, upholding all his promises, upholding everything that heaven has made available for us. Christ is the one that upholds all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of majesty. And I look at verse 4. In verse 4 it says, being made so much better, so much greater, so much higher than the angels he as he as by inheritance obtained, obtained, obtained a more excellent name than they look at Christ. Christ is the Almighty Sustainer. We're looking at Isaiah chapter nine, and we're looking at verse six. Isaiah chapter nine. We're looking at verse six. It tells us in verse six, "For unto us a child is born." Why was Christ born for us? So He can save us and heal us and deliver us, and so that he can take us from the valley of despondency and take us to the mountain top of excitement and joy in the Lord. He says, unto us a child is born. And then it says, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. For all, all when you know, that Christ was born because of you. Given by the Father on the cross because of you. The whole government of your life you put on a shoulder. The administration of your life you put on a shoulder. And the goings in and the goings out of your life. You put upon a shoulder the decisions and desires of your life. You put upon a shoulder. I don't understand the people that say Christ was born for them. And Christ was given for them. And Christ has forgiven them. And Christ has turned their lives around for the better. And they hold unto the government of their lives. And they hold on to the administration of their lives. And they hold on to the leadership of their lives. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, he was born because of you. He gave himself because of you. The government of your life comes upon his shoulder. The church, the church, every church that is named, that names the name of Christ, we put the administration of the church, the government of the church, the leadership of the church, everything the church that we put upon his shoulder. And when this world at the second coming of Christ, when they will receive him at the coming Lord, and they receive him, he is now king of kings and lord of lords. You know what will happen? All the governments of the world will be upon his shoulder. On, on, anywhere, any group of people, any nation, at whatever dispensation, when we accept him and receive him, and we know that is the Son of God, and the whole world accepts him at that time, and the kingdoms of the world shall be the kingdom of our Lord and of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Tell me, Wonderful. Our lives will not be wonderful until we place everything, our mind, our life, our decisions, our behavior, our character, our body, everything will place squarely upon his shoulder. And we say, lead on because I accept you. 
I receive you in a practical way. You are my Lord and sell your life or turn around. Every word you say, every decision you make, every act you act, everything you do, when everything is put upon his shoulder now, will your life be wonderful? He will become the counselor the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Father of eternity, and the Prince of Peace. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, of the increase of his kingdom and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David, upon the kingdom to order it, to order it. Christ is the one that brings orderliness to our lives, you know, when you are confused, you cannot be orderly. And when you are traumatized, you cannot be orderly. When you are thinking of this and thinking of that, and the ideas of the world, they're pulling you here and there in different directions, you cannot be orderly. Your speech will not be orderly. You'll forget yourself. Your actions will not be orderly in the, in the sight of God. But when you place everything on him and you have no care in this world and you cast all your cares on him because he prayed for, prayed for you, then your life will be orderly. Your family will be orderly. Your business will be orderly. Your aspiration, ambition, and everything you go after will just go in line one after the other in Jesus' name. And to establish it with justice, judgment, and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Can you put all your plans in the hands of God and allow the zeal of the Lord of hosts to perform it? Can you put all your project and everything, everything you feel you want to do, put everything in the hands of him who has saved you? And then the zeal of the Lord will perform it in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two here. Point number two, we're looking at the salvation by grace for obedient believing sons. And there are three things we're looking at. Number one, we're looking at so great salvation and escape from eternal suffering. Number two, we're looking at such a great savior and a man's Sepator of endangered sinners. Number three, the gloomy situation and exhortation against empty service. Look at number one. Number one is the great salvation and escape from eternal suffering. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. We need to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. When somebody goes to the doctor, he gives earnest heed. He, he listens to every word because he wants healing. When anybody goes to the bank, he listens to every word and he gives the earnest heed to what the bank manager is saying on your interest going up or you may be you're going in the red and everything is going to be suspended except you do this. When anybody goes to an engineer, he wants to build a house on solid ground, he listens to every word with earnest heed. But human beings is only human beings that come to the Savior who can save them from sin and save them from suffering and save them from hell and save them from all evil here on earth and in eternity. They don't pay the more earnest heat. That's why sinners come to church five times, ten times, two hundred times. They come to church for years and they're not born again. And then why? Why? Because they do not give the more honest heed. 
to the things they hear. That's why many people can come to the church and they say, I'm saved, I'm saved, but their inner life has not been cleansed. There's no sanctification. There's no holiness without which no man shall save the Lord. You know why? They do not give the more earnest heed to the things they have heard. That's why many people come to conferences, the conferences that will lift them up and lift them higher, empower them, and lift them, engage them and make them a different minister and make them somebody that you know will go higher than anybody ever dreamed but it doesn't happen why they do not give the more and they say therefore we ought we ought we have to give the more honest heed to the things which we have heard lest at any time we should let them sleep at the time of decision to decide for Christ. At that time, everything they have heard, they let that sleep. At the time of a sudden temptation, and everything they have heard that will give them the victory, they let that sleep. At the time of challenge, challenge from the world, how they ought to respond, how they ought to react, they let what they have heard, they let that sleep. And because of that, they do not have the victory they ought to have. Look at verse 2. It says, verse 2, the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. Look at verse 3. It says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation the people they don't reject it's not that they say no salvation is not real salvation does not come from christ they believe all that but they neglect there are things you may not reject outright you may not say no i can get saved by myself you say and you accept that jesus and jesus only can save Save from sin, and yet you neglect the time to pray, the time to ask, the time to receive, and the time to have a transforming salvation, and the time to have a life-changing salvation, the time to have a salvation that will put your name in the book of life. You neglect. How do you neglect at the time of prayer? I need to visit the toilet now. Ah, you're neglecting something. Before you come back, we we'll say in Jesus' name we'll pray. And then you just do this and say you got something, you got nothing. How do you neglect? You neglect by at the time of prayer, that the time you are talking to this person and talking, I have not seen you for a long time. So you are there. What have you been? And we're all praying and they are discussing, carrying on there. You neglect your salvation you neglect his power you neglect what christ would have done while you go aside and you are involved in other things and he says how shall we escape damnation how shall we escape condemnation how shall we escape eternal suffering in hellfire if we neglect whether we're jews or gentile if we neglect whether we're members or ministers of the church if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him salvation we must not neglect because it didn't just neglect that's why it says in hebrews chapter 4 reading there from verse 1 hebrews chapter 4 verse 1 let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his race any of you shall seem to come short of it you know after Christ has done everything, you know after you have heard about the way of salvation, about the way of grace, and the way of faith, after you have heard the possibility of being saved, saved now and saved forever, after you have heard, there's still the danger of not 
entering into his rest, not entering into his restoration, not entering into reconciliation with God, not entering into regeneration of your soul and the turning around. You see, there's still the danger of the people who have heard not entering him. And it says in verse 2, it says in verse 2, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. Did not profit them unto salvation. Did not profit them unto sanctification and holiness. The word preached did not profit them unto healing and deliverance. The word preached did not profit them, but the word preached, the word declared, the word emphasized, the word highlighted, did not profit them not being mixed or faith in them that had it. Look at verse 3. In verse 3 it says, For we which have believed do enter into rest, into reconciliation, into regeneration, into restoration, restoration of what Adam lost. And now we come because Christ has come to give us total, complete, and full restoration, we that have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. It's when we give ourselves to what we're hearing. It's then the salvation, real salvation that comes with rest, that comes with reconciliation, that comes with righteousness will be ours. It will be yours in Jesus' name. Let's look at number two there. Number two here, we're looking at such a great savior and emancipator of endangered sinners. Sinners are endangered. In this life, sinners are endangered because Satan is going to and fro and up and down to see whom we will devour. And if there's a sinner there, a deliberate sinner, an habitual sinner, an adamant sinner, a careless sinner, as Satan goes up and down to and fro, is seeking whom he may devour. That's a candidate for being devout. Why? Because they don't keep close to the Savior and they don't keep close to their salvation. But such a great Savior is the one that comes to emancipate us from endangered situations. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood he also himself likewise to part of the same that through death the death at Calvary he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil when Christ died on the cross of Calvary he destroyed the power of the devil over you Amen. but you have to come and say other lords have been our lords. Other men, other ministers, other people, other founders have been our lord. But now we yield ourselves to you as the only lord. And when you do that, what he did at Calvary, that he nullified, he kicked off, he destroyed the power of him that had the power of death, the devil. That's when it avails for you. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject unto bondage. Because of fear, this may happen, that might happen. They call me bondage to herbalist. 
They come in bondage to traditionalists. They come in bondage to the bullies in their life. You know, any, if you want to, you know, surrender to bullies, they are all around. And they bully your life. Don't stand. Don't sit. Don't go. Don't back. Uh, don't, don't get that way. And they bully and bully until they make you to turn your face from the Savior and turn unto them. It might be a man, it might be a woman, and they bully and bully you and shut you down until, even though you claim to be saved, you fear them so much and you remain in bondage. All your bondage shattered in Jesus' name. When you go out and you understand Christ, the Son of God, paid all the price for me. Where is the bully? And where is the fearful, fearsome person? Whatever he has, whoever he is, you turn your eyes away from them. You can even turn your back on them because God is at your back there. Yeah. And it's in your front. Yeah. It's in your side. And underneath you are the everlasting arms. Because you are saved, so you are not subject unto them anymore. You're free in Jesus' name. And in Colossians chapter 2, I'm reading there from verse 13. It says, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has quickened together with him. He has quickened, made a life together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses. Amen. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Then in verse 15, it says, and having spoiled principalities and powers, all principalities and powers, wanting to wage secret war, open war, deadly war against your life. All those principalities and powers, he has made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in each in Jesus' name. Look at number three here. Number three, we're looking at the gloomy situation and the exhortation against empty service. Empty service that takes us nowhere. Empty service that doesn't bring salvation here nor in eternity. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12. It says take heed brethren. It's talking to brethren. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. They were with the living God when he came out of the land of Egypt. But they departed after they sang, after the opening, the dividing of the Red Sea from the even chapter 15 of Exodus and then chapter 16. And then you go on, they departed from the living God. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, but exhort one another. 